Native grass is an adaptive plant, a native plant. He's a, I don't know how long you've, have you been there since the start of Nature's Way? I'm sorry? Nature's Way, how long have you been with them? I've uh, been with them four and a half years. So they, the Nature's Way, if you're not familiar with it, is coming across on this side of the freeway by 1488. And uh, I guess their expertise is making various grades of compost. Mulches and all mulches. Those things. But anyway, they're very much into the natural way to do things. Uh, Mark has helped me a great deal. As I said, every time I come in, in contact with these speakers, I learn something. And I expect to learn something today. So Mark's going to talk to us about those, uh, the, the habitat that we can help produce and things we can do to make our yards and, and area more water efficient. Help me welcome Mark Bolt. Thank you. So I'm a horticulturist by background. I spent 22 years doing design build projects. Uh, another six working exclusively on community projects. And then the last uh, four and a half uh, helping other people with the projects. Uh, so at Nature's Way we, we, um, we make various organic gardening products including mulch, compost, and various soils. And then we work with a lot of homeowners um, doing all kinds of interesting projects from aquaponics to vertical garden to permaculture to all, all sorts of different things. And then of course with a lot of different commercial outfits that are working on engineered um, biosoil mixes or green roof mixes or things of that sort. Um, and so it's, um, it's a lot of fun helping people pursue their passion. Um, so so I am a, I'm definitely a plant geek, a native plant nut. Um, I think I've added some books. Um, have, uh, my first book from 1997, Habitat Gardening for um, Houston in Southeast Texas, and it's um, every every plant in it is a is a Southeast Texas native, so um, they should get one of those books. And um, and then um, yeah, I'll make sure I don't forget. So my um, this talk will be on our website, naturewayresources.com, on the front page Monday. So if anyone wants to go back and you know refer to notes. Um, also, if you look on Amazon, I have this, like my first book, which is all local natives. Um, I put it on Amazon Kindle for free, if anybody ever wants to go check out the text. So, um, anyway, so today I'm going to talk about uh, sustainable landscapes with native plants. One of the first things to really think about is, um, is our region. I remember in, when I was cutting my teeth, you know, going into business uh, full time in the, in the mid 80s, um, I talked some local nurseries into bringing in some native plants. And they, and two of them brought them in without having another conversation. I said, you know, let me know if you're gonna do it. So they ordered native plants and mostly brought in West Texas native plants, Hill Country native plants. And then, you know, and then the nurseries had their irrigation systems where they water everything like twice a day. Most of the plants just rotted right there in the nursery. And both those nurseries said, okay, we're done. So little by little over the years, we've kind of made the point, you gotta kind of think about the region. You know, because we're in, Houston, in this Houston area, we're a lot more similar to New Orleans than we are to El Paso, but they are two different states. Some people think all Texas natives would be well adapted, but I'm, I'm a native. I was born in Herman Hospital, native of this area, and um, you know, I grew up hearing my grandparents talk about frog stranglers and gully washers and all that stuff. So we may be dry at times and have droughts, but we also are going to be underwater at times, as we know. So our plants need to not only handle um, the droughts, but also, you know, the, um, the monsoon, so to speak. And so they've got to be able to kind of go both ways. And then also we need to study our properties and kind of understand the different microclimates. You know, we all have little low wet areas. Those are perfect for rain gardens. We put plants that like it that way anyway, like crinum lilies and spider lilies and other things like that. And then, you know, some of us have areas that do tend to shed water or they're real dry. And that might be a good spot to put your verbenas and other things that like you know, really want, you know, good drainage. So that's something to really think about is, you know, where the plants um, you're buying are coming from, um, you know, and then try to, you know, try to match them up accordingly. Uh, and then just keep in mind, you know, what was here. Um, one of my favorite books is um, Land Explorers Texas by Dale Weiniger, and it goes into all the, all the early accounts of what people found, um, you know, beyond the oral Native American traditions. Um, you know, when this area was settled. And of course, originally, you know, most of the greater Houston region was tall grass prairie. We're not talking about buffalo grass, we're talking about big eastern gamma grass and sugarcane plume grass and big bluestem and um, any, you know, and grasses like that. 
uh, which you can see, um, you know, over to the left, uh, one of the remnant prairies that's still here. Um, and then, of course, we had wetlands. Um, I'm not sure if this has a pointer or not. John, does it have a pointer? Okay, all right, finally found it. Um, okay, and then of course we had uh, wetlands throughout the region, and um, you know most of those have been drained. A lot of people, um, like I used to do that for a living, you know, a lot of wetlands mitigation, putting them back, and um, even at your own property, you want some version of a rain garden or wetland if you're into wildlife, because often that's a real limiting factor. We see birds out drinking irrigation water in the street, you know, when it's during a drought. Um, so of course, wetlands are important, and then of course down below the woods, and of course we. Have the piney woods in this region you go a little west of here you have kind of a crossroads area where you start having some sawgrass prairie post oak savanna and woodlands uh, we're not far from that but you know we are mostly you know piney woods here um, but there are some interesting little remnant um, you know pocket prairies and um, and of course we do have some wetlands you know throughout the area and we have people that are adding more um, partly for habitat partly for um, um, flood management you know as well but I would say if you're into um, having a really functional ecosystem, um, habitat, if you have some element of the three major historic ecosystems, you're going to have a more functional habitat or ecosystem. So if you have some element of a tall grass prairie, that doesn't mean it's going to be a big tall grass prairie. You could mix and match with, you know, shorter plant, you know, the Gulf muleys all over the Espinas and the woodlands, you know, some of the perennials, black-eyed Susans and um, verbenas and other things. So you could make it mix and match where it fits you and your neighborhood. And uh, but yeah, some elk, same thing with the wetlands, you know, it could be a small rain garden, you know, but, um, and then the woods, you know, if you have that combination, you're going to have a lot, you're going to be able to sustain a lot more wildlife, and your property is going to function better, you're going to use less irrigation, and that type of thing. Um, rather than draining all your wet spots, you can plant, put plants like native hibiscus and others that love them naturally, then life's a lot easier. Uh, here are just a couple examples. Um, one of the things I get is, People here, I'm in the native plants. I think, well, you know, I can feel it coming. You know, it's just like, is that kind of that jungly look or, you know, whatever. And um, and actually, you know, what's most you see, not when you drive on the 14 acres, you have the wonderful, beautiful Jones State Forest. Um, but in a lot of areas where you drive around, what you see on the side of the road are mostly non-natives that have been they're kind of alien invasives and they've taken over things like Chinese tallow and Chinese privet and other things. Um, so it's not you can't necessarily go by what's on the side of the road and then also in nature you have patterns you know so it's not just a hodgepodge you go to any beautiful natural area it's going to be pastoral or scenic and you have certain plants that are dominance and co-dominance and accents but if you study a little bit more you'll see these really pretty patterns so that thing about the menagerie effect and all is very is not natural that's more like somebody got one of everything at a whole bunch of sales put it all there but that's not how nature works you know so but one thing, I've got a couple slides here just to kind of show you. You can, you can take native plants and use them in any style you want. You know, I've even, down in River Oaks once upon a time, put in a few formal native landscapes. And, um, you know, so you can do, you know, cottage garden style, the Eastern Tea Garden, you know, formal, more eclectic, um, you know, whatever might be of interest to you. So don't let, you know, if you hear something's a native plant, that doesn't mean your whole landscape um, you know, necessarily has to be well. Now, if you want it to be well, you know, so, you know, go for it. Um, if you think it fits your sensibilities and your neighborhoods. And, um, but here's some landscapes where you see they, they flow and they're, they're open and uh, you can get around. And, um, and you do see that more and more where people are combining, um, you know, landscapes with, um, um, you know, some hardscape elements. As much as possible, uh, you want um, some porosity where, you know, the moisture can soak in. And if it's if it's flat out hardscape like for like this one below, you're normally going to want to shed that water to an area that can then use the water, like a rain garden or something like that. Um, and then on the shady side, those first two were kind of some more sunny landscapes, but like this one on the right is pretty typical of that effect in the woodlands. A lot of people, you know, there's a saying: your front yard's your reputation, your backyard's your character. So you know, for those that are worried about being viewed as, and then Felder rushing, you know, said. What is it? Have fun with your landscape. Your neighbors are going to talk about you anyway. You know, there's that too. So, um, sorry, I'm slightly irreverent, so it goes with my territory. Um, but I want everybody to live in harmony with their neighbors, of course. Um, 
So this one on the right is kind of an example of you don't, you're worried about your neighbors thinking you're a hermit, you know, if you're more of an introvert anyway kind of thing. Um, you can do this, what they call the high-low effect. Um, when I designed part of Memorial Park a long time ago, they wanted the high-low effect because of a different kind of predator, human predators, unfortunately. So people could see if somebody's coming or whatever. Uh, it's not uncommon in park designs these days, but um, a lot of people do it on their landscapes where they've got their trees, their overstory trees, and then they may have ground covers and other lower plants where it's kind of that open, friendly look, and it, we call it high-low, where your eye can kind of penetrate. So you want people to see the architectural features of your house and you know, how friendly you are, um, you can do that. And then this one on the left, this is a property we had landscaped um, over near the Houstonian down in Houston years ago. And we put in a pond and there's an island and a bridge. They had a little bit of land. And there they wanted, they entertained a lot. They wanted near the house, they wanted kind of open and low and friendly. And then they did want a little grass area, which I encourage people to get down to just what you have to have, not where it's just by default everywhere. Um, and then on the edge, and this property was adjacent to Buffalo Bio, they actually wanted a green belt. They wanted it one, so that their property would kind of feel like an urban oasis. And then two, they were very into wildlife. So we see lots of wood ducks and we saw a red fox on this property. And, uh, but that was kind of around the perimeter. So a lot of people kind of mix and match in a way that fits their sensibility. Uh, all right, we're gonna get into the talk shop on some plants. So these are all Southeast Texas natives. Um, and there's some, like Prairie Verbena, where you, you have to go to a native plant nursery to probably find this verbena, but you're going to find a lot of the offshoots. So a lot of times what people will do is take the uh, natural selections or cultivars or plants like this, and you'll see them out in the tray. And many of those are still very good, like homestead verbena you see a lot with the big purple flowers. It tends to be even evergreen in the winter. It's very tough, no insect or disease problems. It's fine. You just, you know, and then there's others that say verbenas that are um, like at some of the box stores where they've taken them to the point where they're not perennial anymore. So you want to kind of little by little get to know and ask those questions. Is this variety, is it native? Um, and if so, will it naturalize likely or at least reseed? And if it's not native, is it at least a perennial? And so those are some questions to ask. But anyway, this is kind of one of the original natives. You can find it at some native plant nurseries or at like a, um, Native American seed, which is probably my favorite for getting um, seed of native plants. And um, it is a Texas company. So Prairie Verbena kind of is like a, um, you know, grows like a carpet. And if you've ever had that area in the lawn where the chinch bugs always eat it, you know, near the concrete or whatever, you want to make a little bed there, um, this might do great there because it likes it hot and dry. And of course it has these, um, um, you know, these flowers that have the, so-called platform flowers that are very attractive to um, butterflies where they can land on, on them and enjoy the nectar. Uh, and prairie verbena is very drought resistant. So that's a, that's a good one to consider for your garden. It needs full sun, good drainage. Uh, prairie phlox, um, phlox pelosa. This is one that you see a lot in the piney woods. And it's usually not growing in real dense woods like we've got pines and yopon everywhere, but it'll often be on the edge where it's getting like morning sun, maybe some afternoon protection but it does very well in our area. Just remember, this is not like summer flocks. So this is more like a woodland's edge flocks, or, unless you, or if you have like really open woods, you know, you have some pine trees kind of scattered, but you have a lot of sunlight coming through. Um, you know, they, you know, it's a great one for this area. That's, that's on prairie flock. Uh, Black-eyed Susan. This one is probably the closest. It is a cross, but our native one, um, Rebecca Fulgita, um, uh, the, the one that's truly native, you're only going to see in seed form. Like if you do a, a wildflower mix, you can get that through Native American seed. This is one that is a cultivar, but I think it, it has still most of the traits of the native. And then one of the nice things for um, cultivated landscapes is that it's very consistent. So when it'll bloom off and on during the warm season, often you'll get oh um, at least three sets of bloom, sometimes four. And then when it finishes, if you're in the songbirds, leave the seed heads so the songbirds can enjoy them before deadheading them or cutting them back. And when you do cut them back, you're just gonna, it's gonna look like a ground cover. If it goes back to like a rosette, and you can see the leaves down low, um, it's attractive even as a, when it's not blooming. Um, and then the other great thing about this plant, they can handle Beaumont clay, um, maybe just working a little compost to a more of a sandy loam soil. So they're very tolerant of different kinds of soil. They'll probably bloom best in full sun, but they will take a little um, 
partial shake, you know, then they just may not bloom quite as much. Um, good for butterflies as well. Um, and, and then just a tough plant, like this one, even though it's a cultivar, will very often naturalize. You know, and that's great, you know, so you have less attrition year to year, you know, as far as replacing plants. Uh, tropical sage, so this is native to this area. Um, the, the true native one is Salvia coccinea, is a, is a red. And then now these all these, um, um, these natural selections where they mutate, speciate a little bit. Uh, and then there's some cultivars as well. So you can find it in white and coral and pink, soft pink and all kinds of different colors. Um, this is a plant you don't actually put near your front door because when it's um, in between blooming spurts, sometimes it can look a little rangy. And, um, uh, but this would be great if you have an area of the woods where you, you, know, you think, okay, all I have out there is, you know, I've got yopon and, you know, some pines and water oak and that kind of thing. And I like to have some interest, you know, and so this is a great plant for that. You can put it, um, you know, in an area like this, and it'll almost be like a ground cover that comes up and blooms. And then it when it's fully done, then you can go prune it back and let it start over. But it's pretty tough, and then it's a major attractor to the um, hummy, hummingbirds, particularly, you know, May and then again in the fall. And then, and then speaking of um, being water uh, conservation oriented, sometimes in a drought, this plant will go semi-dormant, or if it's a really severe drought and you don't water it, you could lose the parent population, but then typically it's gonna seed out, and so you may, the next time you're, not, you're out of the drought, um, you may get the offspring, you know, coming back. Butterfly weed, so um, these days there's a lot of focus on native butterfly weed, so this is kind of the king of the native ones. The Slepius tuberosa. Um, so this is native here, and there's a, there are many others. And um, um, so it's a, anyway, it's a great plant. It's not only a host to the monarch butterfly, but it's also a good beneficial insectary plant. Butterfly weeds will sometimes harbor a, a minor crop of aphids, which some people will freak out about. But if you like to grow bush beans or crepe myrtles, or you have them in your property, you want this plant because it's a, basically a trap plant. It'll host a few aphids. And then it tracks in hoverflies and sassin bugs and all kinds of beneficials um, that go after those aphids um, on this plant and elsewhere. But it'll maintain a little seed crop aphids so you have year-round beneficials, which is you know really critical. Fall aster. So this is a, a great aster if you like some color. It's super drought tolerant. Um, if you want like some pop, if you combine this like with the black eyed Susans, you know you get that yellow and purple. They're all opposite ends of the color wheel. So my my wife's real good. Says you know, for miles I need it where I'm going, whatever they see at 35 miles an hour. You know, so if you combine this with a yellow, it's gonna pop. You know, if you're and um, but anyway, it's really tough. You know, it'll get up to about here. Uh, when it's not blooming, it's kind of like a ground cover. Um, but anyway, it's a, it's a great plant. So this is a native hibiscus. For anybody that's ever had the exotic non-native hibiscus freeze to death or get consumed with white flies to the point you rip them out, um, this is an alternative. So this is native to right here. There's also a, a smaller version called hibiscus daisy calyx or Natchez River um, um, hibiscus. This one gets big, like if you have a, a naturally wet area or you have some sort of a nature pond, you could put it kind of at the back of the nature pond or a naturally wet area. And um, it, it's gonna grow anywhere from like six to 12 feet tall. Uh, tracks hummingbirds, um, is a beneficial insect plant, tracks hoverflies, and, um, and it won't freeze to death. It may freeze down, but not to death. So, Gulf Muley, of course this is, you know, all over the, these days in Woodlands or Cinco Ranch, you look at the Esplanade, you're gonna see a lot of grasses like this. And they're, they're a win-win. I'm all about being green, but I'm a, um, I like for things to be um, financially efficient too and cost effective. And so this is a good example. You put it out in an Esplanade, it needs very little water, it's very tough, has no insect or disease problems, and it's one of the best pollinator plants there is. Everybody always thinks big flowers for pollinators, but see that, that this is, they call it, also call it fire on the prairie or cotton candy. So all that maroon, autumn, those autumnal hues, that's all what they call inflorescence. Those are a bunch of little bitty flowers. And so they really help sustain our pollinators that not only help pollinate plants, but um, help deal with any kind of pest problem. Um, so Gulf Muley needs full sun, good drainage, and it is one of the original seven native prairie grasses to this area. So, and, and of course you can combine it with other things. You could do what they call drifts. You could have a little blob of malt muley 
you have a, next a little blob or drift of verbena. You have another you mix of another grass like little blue stem, and then maybe some rudbeckias. So you don't necessarily have to have a landscape that would be like a an authentic native prairie. It could be you could mix and match in your own manner, where it kind of functions in terms of being tough, kind of like a native prairie, but then aesthetically it fits your sensibilities and and potentially your neighbors. Uh, so little blue stem. Uh, this one has an amazing range. Um, if there's ever a miss on it, it's probably in soils, like we had a little bit with um, um, Lone Star, where the soils have poor internal drainage. And so, um, but it's interesting. It'll handle clay loam pretty well as long as it drains through fairly well, and then it'll grow in sugar sand out in Belleville. So this plant typically has a very good range. It's little blue stem. It doesn't get great big. It's usually oh, two to four feet or so. Big blue stem is really big. Um, this is a great plant. It has the... Um, Kind of the blue hued foliage and very well behaved if you're kind of mixing matching in an open sunny area golf muley little blue stem are two good ones to you know to think about and of course it has that very upright detail design type look to it whereas the muley tends to be more of a cascading type effect inland sea oats this is um our only really our only native grass that loves the shade um, so it uh, it'll sometimes handle some but it can look bleached out in the summer um, some people say it almost has a little bit of a bamboo looking quality to it, but um, um, and it does it does go like this is a property I did years ago down in the Matros area. They wanted something that couldn't grow anything in this area between the hardscape and the fence, and they had some shade. And so they, the sea oats, you know, was great there. It took over, and they wanted it to take over, and it was tough as nails. And um, so of course it has these um, these seeds in the fall that are real popular wood ducks. And um, it's just a very tough plant for the shade. But it's not a, you know, these native grasses are not turf grasses. And they're not like buffalo. So you're not going to mow them. They're going to get up a little bigger. And um, again, that's inland sea. If you ever go to Jesse Jones Nature Center, you see all up and down the river, all the river birches and cottonwoods. And then down low, you're going to see sea oats all over, you know, growing down on the, on the banks. You know, so it's a native to right, right around here. Um, horse herb is a plant you see a lot of people uh, nuking out of their lawns. The other one I didn't bring, but Aster subulatus, Texas Aster, that's the one I've seen people try to nuke with weed feed more than anything, and I think it's one of the top five pollinator plants, actually. It's the little bitty white flower Aster that grows in your lawns. Um, but this is, horse herb likes the shade. Um, it's even in Native Texas Plains by Sally Wasowski, that book. So if you ever have any really hard to grow shady areas, you could actually find this. It's hard to buy it. But you might find it here and there. People want to get rid of it and can kind of put it together. But it's, it's tough as nails. Um, I have an area near my office where it's just brutal. Everybody tramples down, and this is the plant that handles it. So, uh, wood fern. Um, so, wood fern is one of those where if you have kind of some damp woods, uh, this might be a plant for you. You've got a property, there's one area that's just always kind of moist. Um, and maybe, you know, in the old days, people would think about putting cast iron plant there, but in a wet cast iron plant, you know, gets scale, I don't recommend it. Um, but this is a plant that can eat lots of space. Um, and the fact that it has a, a light color, if it, you put it off in the distance, when it looks great, it comes forward. It does go dormant in the winter, but if you put it kind of off in the distance, that won't really matter so much, you know. Um, but it's really tough, it'll handle heavy soils well um, and moist soils. And that's part of being, you know, water conscious. It's not all about drop tolerant plants, but it's just the mixing and matching where you're appropriately matching the plants that like the moisture in the wet parts of your property, and then you're avoiding draining those and then flooding somebody downstream by draining off your water. Um, so that's you know where you want plants like this, is those areas that are naturally wet. Um, so this is blue mist flower. This is a great Bloomin's Edge plant, good pollinator plant. Very colorful. I mean, it's beautiful. It has kind of an ethereal quality to it. So it has these kind of light lavender uh, flowers particularly shows up in the fall. So this is one kind of like Phlox pelosa. You put in bright woods or on the edge of your woods, and um, it's pr pretty awesome. Gulf Coast Pinstem, it is not the most showy plant, but it's very consistent. It's you know, native right here. It has these bell-shaped, it always looks better in person than in pictures, but um, it has these bell-shaped flowers. They do attract hummingbirds. Um, the flock, it'll get up to about here or so, um, you know, roughly about 18 inches to two feet. And when it's not blooming, it just kind of looks like a ground cover. 
but it'll handle straight clay if you're just working a little compost uh, or a sandy loam. Uh, it grows best kind of in between, not your blazing hot sun and not deep shade, kind of that partial shade to moderate shade um, situation. It won't bloom as much if it gets more shade, but, um, but probably for the most part, partial sun is probably the best for it. Again, that's Gulf Coast Pensament. When it finishes blooming, if you cut it back, you'll normally get at least one more bloom cycle out of it. Uh, Gay Feather, of course, is an incredible cut flower. People like cut flowers. And there's um, several different species that grow in the area. Um, but this is a, a, one of those great plants if you're going to use some prairie grasses, some verbenas, another thing to kind of mix this in. And when it, when it really goes, in the, they can bloom um, late spring through fall in different you know, spurts. And, uh, but it's, they're great, of course, incredible pollinator plants. It's super drought tolerant. Gara is one that, um, that, where I see it native is on the west side of town, like the Barker Cypress area, it's all through the fields. It's where I've seen it the heaviest in Texas is Corpus Christi. Um, but it, this one does need fairly good drainage, but it's really, really tough. And it has these, you see it now in white or pink, it has these really great, almost hibiscus-like flowers. Um, and they kind of move in the wind, which is nice. And one of the nice things about gardens with some grasses and all is you get that movement on the windy days, which is pretty neat. And um, attracts lots of butterflies. And, um, and then the, the base of the plant just kind of, it does look more like a, it's like a, a rosette, um, kind of more ground coverage. So even when it's not blooming, you've got kind of a basic plant kind of you know, covering the ground. Again, that's Gara. Drum and Turk's cap. So this is a native little uh, woody perennial to, to a medium-sized shrub. Um, this is another one that's good if you have the those tough woods. You've been, um, you know, you've had yopon and beauty berry and all this, and you want something to kind of anchor down an area that gives you some color, maybe provide some habitat, and you don't have to irrigate at all, other than maybe to get it established. And so this fits that bill. Uh, it has the um, flower that they thought once upon a time re re resembled the Turkish fez cap, the military officers in Turkey used to wear, and um, um, it tracks hummingbirds really well, and then it does produce a fruit that I think I'm in the, what is it, one millionth of a percentile that likes. It has kind of a apple watermelon flavor. It is a little mealy, but I think they're pretty good. Um, anyway, and it's a butterfly host plant, but it's really, really tough. And it'll grow in the woods, and when it finishes flowering and fruiting, it may be up to about here, and then just whack it back and let it start over. But it's, it's real tough, and once it's established, it doesn't need any irrigation. Coral berry is another like that. Once it's established, so if you're tired of just Japanese boxwood and dwarf yopon and all that stuff, you know you want something different that's also a habitat plant and even more drought tolerant uh, that can handle shade. You might consider coral berry. Um, so it, it's it's kind of a, a low to moderate sized plant, um, tough as nails. It does have these berries in the fall that are real popular with cardinals and other songbirds, and um, and again just very very drought tolerant. Or Barbados cherry. Uh, I put it in here. I think technically it, it kind of got to Texas as soon as it could, but it got here so long ago that a lot of people think of it as native. I call it nearly native, um, but it's pretty darn good. So like when people say, I'm tired of that infamous one leaf spot with all my ballerina hawthorns, what do I do? Well, thank goodness for this plant because it has that mounding habit, just like Indian hawthorn. It has no insect or disease problems. It produces a little fruit that's really popular with songbirds, and um, I think it tastes good too, but I like wild edibles. And, um, and there is a, a more tropical version that gets really big, that has bigger fruit that are really prized. And, um, and then it has these um, pink flowers that come off and on during the warm season. So this is dwarf Barbados cherry, and it's really easy to use it as a foundation shrub. It'll handle partial shade to full sun, and it is slow growing, so get a, at least a five gallon to start with. Get a seven if you can, or even a 10 or 15, but it's easy to keep, say, in this range. So if you want to keep it under your window height, you could, or if you want to let it get bigger, you could let it eventually get to about up here. Again, that's Dwarf Barbados cherry. Virginia Sweet Spire, so there's another one. Thank goodness for people that are tired of, um, have had problems with azaleas. And, and I will say a lot of times it's genetics because I've had a lot of clients that used to be in, along Buffalo and White Bios where their azaleas probably grew more like they did in Iowa Hog today, Bio Bend, where they're much tougher growing without irrigation, just incredible. I think in terms of breeding, they, everybody went for show 
at the expense of hardiness. And so if you have some of those that have been wimpy or you can't find the good ones and you're tired of iron fluorosis and what, petal blight, root rot, on and on, um, this is a native alternative that has no insect or disease problem. Virginia sweet spire, it has these white flower spires in the spring, similar time to azaleas actually, a little bit later. And then when they finish, it has these great seeds that are really valuable for songbirds. Um, I wouldn't put it, you don't have to make a big azalea type A, because this plant will handle moisture. It'll handle straight clay. So I would probably just work a little compost in the soil just to improve it, but it doesn't need a raised bed per se. And it forms a nice little colony and it's just really, really tough. You could keep them, say, you know, this range, or if, you, if they're on a back fence or something, let them drape. And you know they, they could be eight to ten feet if you never prune them. Sun or shade? Um, they can take sun as long as they don't get too dry. But I would normally put them in uh, anywhere from partial shade to moderate sun, personally. Oakleaf hydrangea. Now they're one that really kind of needs to go in a spot that's just naturally moist. A lot of people have that spot somewhere on their property. The area that's naturally moist and naturally has a higher organic matter content. You might work a little extra compost, plant them, and add some more pine straw. Uh, but they're really great. I mean, they're native to just the other side of the Trinity, not to right here, but they do well here if they get the right spot. But these flowers are incredible, and you don't have to worry about doing all this tinkering on your soil nutrients, you know, as, as is the case with, you know, regular hydrangeas, and they're real tough, you know, once established. Leatherwood. Um, this is a, uh, you can see the, the same plant as fall color and these, um, these white flower racemes. It's actually a, a great specimen plant. So if you have that kind of mucky area, this is a, they also call it a tie thai. Uh, anyway, this is a really exquisite, um, you know, plant for kind of a naturally wet area. Southern arrowhead. So this is a, a big shrub for those that don't want to irrigate the woods. So say you have a back 40 and you don't want just all pine trees in your pond. You want some, you know, you want some shrubbiness. Um, these can fit the bill. They have, like a lot of viburnums, they do have the big white flower bouquets, which are great for butterflies. They have berries in the fall for um, songbirds. And, um, and then they just really fill space. They are deciduous, so keep that in mind. Um, but they're, they're, they're just really tough and you need no irrigation once established. Uh, this is a uh, wax myrtle, and so, um, Here's one where, you know, many years ago, I was really happy this exists, back in the days of lots of wax ligustrum and um, Chinese privet and all that kind of stuff. And so this is a native um, shrub, and um, shrub to, to tree, really. Like I have some, um, a couple at my house that are approaching 40, 45 feet. Um, so this is, this is a plant that colonizes. It's also a nitrogen fixer. So when you see it in nature, it's out ahead of the woods. It's fixing nitrogen, adding it to the soil. It's a pioneer. And then as the woods come later, you know, they benefit from that nitrogen. So all the ecosystems have a, uh, what they call a natural succession. Way down the road, you might see something like an American beech, but don't put an American beech or a flowering dogwood in a pioneer soil because they're not going to live. But these are the plants that pave the way. And then they're also, I don't know if you've heard of bayberry candles. Once upon a time, they used to use the berries for making bayberry candles. The um, foliage is very aromatic. You bring it in, it's really great. Just you know, rub it. And then the berries also are known to attract 37 different species of walleye. Um, and then the other great thing is once established, this plant doesn't need irrigation once established. And um, just don't put it in wet shade. Like in the woods, um, when a wood uh, forest is expanding, once the forest catches it and passes it, and it gets shady, and maybe it gets more moist, then they die. So don't put it in wet shade because it's going to just start dying. The other thing, don't tree it up. That's bad. This almost grows more like a native grass. A native grass mulches itself. The old leaves eventually settle down and mulch, form a mulch, and then the new ones come up. Well, this does the same thing. The old stems and trunks eventually give way to the new ones. And if you tree it up and all you have are the old ones, you're going to eventually lose the whole plant. So you see that a lot. If you're gonna plant kind of like a southern magnolia, oh, please don't tree those up. Put it in the back 40 where it can grow to the ground and they're you know, exquisite that way. So just let them be natural like this one on the right. Um, and just remember, don't try to keep them at fence height or something. They're gonna look terrible. 
So they need, but they're a good buffer. You know, you've got that noisy neighbor, or you're on behind a back up to a free. Uh, well, it could be a freeway around here these days. Um, yeah. This is a good green belt plant, you know, to kind of give you some buffer. Red buckeye. Um, this is a. It's a kind of one of a kind. It's the only plant that fits this description. Uh, it it'll grow in the shade. Uh, it has these red tubular flowers. It's a small tree. Has these glossy palmate leaves. Uh, attracts hummingbirds. The, it's a host plant for butterflies. And it's real tough once established. Just in the summer, sometimes it'll go semi dormant. That doesn't mean it's dead. It just takes a break. You know, it blooms late spring and then pops back out in the fall. Um, if you ever, if you like hummingbirds or whatever, go down to Brazos Bend State Park. You know. Um, Let's see, May. You might still see, see the back end of some of them blooming, but they even have a red buckeye trail. It's pretty incredible. Um, anyway, this is a good accent plant in the shade. Pawpaws, so those are, these are also native um, on the other side of the Trinity. So kind of like oak leaf hydrangeas, mayhaws, pawpaws, um, but they do grow really well here. So if you have a high organic matter, when I say high organic matter, it's like it feels kind of compost and rich um, um, part of the property that seems to naturally be a little moist um, and at least get some break from the sun. It could be a little afternoon shade, uh, it could be some midday, but kind of in the bright shade category of morning sun, uh, then you might consider this plant. It has these um, fruit that uh, one of my mentors, Lynn Lowry, told me when I was asking what he thought of the taste. Uh, he said, they can taste anywhere from like banana custard to turpentine, depending <laughs> on which one you get. And so, um, so if you buy one, you know you might want to um, you might want to ask or Somebody or just or, or get a name variety. You know, yeah, there you go. You got Paul to taste it. So um, you know he's he's a fisherman. They'll taste about anything. So <clears throat> and tell you a story about it. So um, but but they're great. They're really interesting plants. And then um, and actually it's going to be one of the new organic um, pesticides. Actually, they're grinding up the leaf apparently there is kind of a broad spectrum kind of like rosemary oil so it's um, a new thing but anyway it's a great little small tree and um, you might consider it rusty black hall viburnum this is my favorite woody plant um, it's got these great halls in the fall for wildlife in the spring has these um, beautiful white you know viburnum like macaze and then in the fall it reliably turns color this is kind of a specimen plant so if you've got you really want to kind of show off an incredible plant. Um, and it's a, it's a large shrub. It can be anywhere from like 12 feet to, to 20 feet. And um, it does need a high organic matter soil. Once established, it's really tough as far as moisture. And um, if you ever want to see them in the wild, go to um, Lake Livingston State Park right near the cabins. There's a ravine and it's chock full of these. Um, and there's viburnums in general are a great category. Um, you know, there's this one, there's a cross of this called Lord Byron, which is um, mostly evergreen, where this one is deciduous. And then another one that's not native here, but it's native to the Corkscrew Swamp in Florida, but does well here, is called Walter's Viburnum. And that one's really great for screening in sun. It's really tough, uh, and it's more um, mostly evergreen. But this is this is just a really interesting plant. Uh, and then possum haw holly, um, a lot of people in this area, yopons have their purpose. I mean, they're very important for wildlife. I know some people have had enough, but um, they're also really good for green belts, but I get it. A lot of people have, you know, have on overload there. But um, this is another one to consider. So it doesn't tend to colonize like yopons do. This is possum holly. It's actually deciduous. It loses its leaves in the winter. And the fact that it loses its leaves, when it puts on a berry show, it pops a lot more. So if you put this kind of in an open landscape, they're really incredible. I'll use these more that way than in the woods. And, um, and of course, their berries are persistent in the winter, which is important, because like when cedar waxwings and robins have, ex have exhausted a lot of other food supplies, these are you know, often still there. Parsley hawthorns, that's another one of my favorite. You see them poking out of the little esplanades. If you grow up and down Grogan's Mill um, and other areas in the, in the woodlands. Um, so this is a, a tree. There's a lot of hawthorn. These are not related to Indian hawthorn. These are tree hawthorns. There's green haw, may haw related. Um, you know, there's a, a whole bunch of them. Uh, so parsley haw has a parsley shaped leaf, hence the name. And it uh, has white flowers late winter to early spring, great fall color. Um, and then this is a plant that will grow in amongst your pine trees or on a woodland's edge. 
and it's very, you know, they're very attractive and very tough. And um, uh, anyway, it's one that's being considered. It'll handle a heavy soil too, real heavy clay, just working a little organic matter. And um, same way they're, and then once established, they need no irrigation. River birch, um, before I forget, with river birch, just keep in mind, most of what's on the market is from Florida. They tend to be not as adapted and more prone to getting borers. So I uh, normally see a tree out there riddled with borer that's from Florida. Um, but the native ones from here, I mean, they're all up and down Spring Creek and you know this area. Uh, but if you have an area that is naturally moist, um, you might consider river birch. I mean, they have the peeling, the exquisite peeling bark and um, of course the beautiful foliage. And then that, even when they lose their leaves, they have that kind of that architectural detail that's you know really, really impressive. Um, and people may associate this plant of needing tons of water, but just remember, it's not always cause and effect. If you drive across the Shopalai Bridge and see all the bald cypress growing in 10 feet of water, that means they tolerate it. Doesn't necessarily mean that's their favorite. It's like these will actually handle pretty regular landscape situation or a lot of water, you know. American hollies, um, these are all through the area. You're not going to see that many of the true native ones in the trade, but you'll see some cultivars. Like one of the ones that's real common is um, Savannah, which is a good one. And you see East Palatka. Savannah holly tends to have the more American holly type growth, pyramidal, conical type growth habit. And then East Palatka is denser. I would say it's probably better for screening if you're trying to create a screen. These are really great in terms of the fruit for um, wildlife. Once established, they need very little or no irrigation. Um, and, um, and again, if, you're, if you are trying to create a buffer, things like wax myrtle, American holly, even wild holly pines, do create, they're all native and create a great buffer of screening if you do back up to a roadway or something like that. <coughs> Sweet Bay Magnolia, this is um, a smaller native magnolia that will handle uh, wet spots really well. So Southern Magnolia needs a ton of room, and if it doesn't get fairly good drainage, it's gonna get scale. So you get, you know, Southern Magnolia, make sure they have good drainage. Uh, but these, these ones are actually swamp magnolias. They're smaller. The fragrance on the flowers is even more pronounced. They used to make perfumes more out of this one. Um, Southern magnolias were kind of the backup once upon a time. Um, but anyway, they, they commonly get to say 20, 30 feet. Uh, Mexican plums, they're super drought tolerant. They're all over the woodlands. You see going down research by Bear Branch, there's some out there in the sun. And um, um, anyway, they, they grow anywhere from 20 to 35 feet. Again, super drought tolerant, great pollinator plants. They produce edible fruit that are popular with wildlife and including sugar feeding butterflies. And um, I, I would get, you know, just make sure you give them some room. I'd grow them probably on the woodland's edge or, uh, or if you have bright woods. Um, or even in the sun, you just want to make sure that, um, you know, they do have a little bit of room. And um, that's probably the main thing. And then, and then the other thing is make sure you get some that are grown out in southeast Texas because you'll find that. Some of the ones grown in the hill country tend to rot here, and some of the ones that grow here tend to fry in the hill country. Kind of like red buds. Texas red buds aren't from here, actually. They're from northern Mexico in the hill country. They tend to rot here. Eastern red buds, you know, are actually native here, and they tend to fry in the hill country. So that's why it's that much more important. Try to get plants that are grown, have been grown for generations within 150 miles or so. Ideally, less than 100, but kind of 150 max. Uh, May haws, of course, those uh, those are um, related to that parsley hawthorn. Um, they're very tough. Just put them in a spot that's you know you have kind of a, a heavy soil that's a little bit organic rich, but it can be moist and um, they're soup, they're um, very hardy. And then of course they have the great fruit. Um, you may have had a chance to go to the May Hall Festival out in um, um, uh, oh, what's next to Marshall, but uh, the town. They make good jelly. They're really great. Oh, way up in East Texas, they have all these Mayhaw festivals. Yeah, I haven't had a yeah. chance. And um, um, native French tree. So this is a one of my favorites. Uh, it's they get big, like 20, 25 feet. They're a good woodlands edge plant. Uh, but if you have a lot of pine trees and you want to kind of add some interest, that's where pasta hawthorns and French trees come in. You know where you get all these different harbingers of spring. You know all these different flowers. They call this. Um, the flowers are very ethereal looking. They also call it Grancy Graybeard. Um, the, the fruit are very valuable for wildlife. Just make sure you get a female there. There's enough males out there to where it's okay. Um, 
But anyway, you know, really tough plant, um, you know, for wooded areas that need irrigation once it's established. And then there is a, uh, a different version, which is not native, but I would say I'm okay with it. It's a, the Chinese French tree, which you do see a lot. It's not invasive and it'll handle the sunny areas. It's a little bit smaller and more compact. It's, an, it's another good, good choice. Drama red maple, this is our, well, one of our most common uh, native maples. You'll see it out in the woods quite a bit. If you ever want a really, you say you have a heavy clay soil, um, you want something fast growing, you know, in the old days in Houston, uh, Paul and I would always see, you know, that man Arizona ash or Chinese elm or something like that. And that was always a sad deal. Arizona ash usually would die out in 35 years or whatever or less. Anyway, this one's fast growing um, and has beautiful fall color. And it's just a great tree, pretty upright. And um, so anyway, it's one to consider. You want a big tree. Ideally, you put it on the south side of the house. So then in the winter, when that sun angle is lower, you lose the leaves and it helps, you know, with some passive silver heating in your house. So it's good for that kind of situation. Swamp chestnut oak, this is one of the, probably my favorite oak. Um, it's closely related to the white oak. And uh, you see it a lot in this area. It's another one that'll handle heavy soils, poor soils very well. And um, has these uh, large leaves, you get fall color. You have kind of the, similar to the white oak trunks with that white issue, um, but just very, very tough. I mean, white oaks are great. Uh, white oaks can take spots that are a little bit drier, and then swamp chestnut oaks can take the you know swampier type areas, and that's part of it, kind of ma you know matching it up. You know, bur, bur oaks will take it super dry. I do recommend sticking with the white oak family because the red oak family is more susceptible to oak wilt, and so um, you just have a little bit more resistance. You know, with the white oak family, which includes you know white oak, swamp chestnut, oak, bur oak. Cross vine is a is a super tough vine. Um, for this area, uh, this this fence on the left is one that we we're able to just um, establish it by you know letting it grow. It has these little tendrils that'll self-attach, which is great. Unlike say um, fig ivy, which you know self-attach, but then you have to use a sandblaster to get it off. This one self-attaches, but you can just pull it right off. Again, it's native. If you find it out in the woods, you'll see it growing up pine trees, but it doesn't kill them. You know, actually, a lot of vines like this actually cool the pine, the trees. So they're actually beneficial, unlike kudzu or something like that, or, or Chinese wisteria, which is a horrible alien, alien invasive. But, um, so this one's tough. It can grow in very poor soils. It's drought tolerant. It has flowers, particularly in late spring and fall when hummingbirds are coming through, um, and it'll show some fall color. And again, that's cross line. Texas wisteria is the one to use instead of Chinese wisteria. So Chinese wisteria, I'm sure you all seen the invasive list. Um, but you know, there's plants like Chinese tallow, um, Chinese privet, Chinese wisteria. Not all Chinese plants. There's a lot of great edibles. So, you know, of course, Chinese fringe tree is great. So, but unfortunately, bring plants in from other parts of the world. Some of those turn out to be invasives. You know, like giant salvia that's choking out a lot of our lakes and you know things like that. And um, or water hyacinths. We see those all over Lake Woodlands. You know, we have to skim them before the iron man or whatever. And um, so Texas wisteria is native and it's not it's not going to kill your tree. Like Chinese wisteria will get up on trees and kill them and um, well, this one's more behaved so if you want to put it on a pergola or trellis or something like that um, you know it's great it still has many of the same characteristics of Chinese wisteria but it's just it's just tougher um, here's some stuff that's out there most of this is from old is old and out of print working on something new but it's not out yet and um, so uh, you can uh, oh, so if you go to Nature's Way Resources Monday, you'll see I'll have this program up on the main our main website page, just to save paper. And then um, um, we're doing Habitat Gardening, my first book in 97 as a door prize. And that one you can find for free on, as, on Kindle Reader. My second book, which is about kind of mixing and matching native and well-adapted non-natives, what I call something I call nearly native, um, I think I also have it for free on Kindle Reader, where you can at least see the text. And then... Um, um, that bioplanning guide, if you're on a creek or something, you can get that free from the Biopreservation Association. And, um, you know, anyway, there's some. And then this last one, you can see it's like even at Lowe's or Amazon. Um, I was one of the designers that contributed that. And that has various native plants that are mixed and matched with non natives in all kinds of different landscape situations. So if you're looking to kind of design certain spots, that may be a good resource. And, um, see, I think we've got a little bit more time. We have questions. I think that's it. On, mine in terms of the presentation.
how many of y'all learned something today? <laughs> I told you. Uh, I just want to ask a question before we go. Uh, when you talk about all the varieties, it seems like something as simple as lantana we think is kind of a adaptive, but then some of them freeze and we don't realize. So how important is that? How do you make sure that it's the ones that are hardy and really adaptive rather than buying? get the scientific name or just go to a proper store? Uh, yeah, I would say one of the things would be to go to a, uh, a mom and pop, you know, whether it's Arborgate or RCW or, you know, and then when you're talking to somebody, you want to get a sense that they actually know these plants. If somebody just has to read off that label, then go the other way. Yeah. And, um, and, then, and then compare notes and go to classes and get out there and then, um, and as you see things out in the landscape, you know, they say it take, you have to kill a thousand plants to be a so-called expert. Well, I would say it's a lot cheaper to observe the plant killing practices of your neighbors. And so as you see these things out there, if you can check out a little label, hey, what you got there? You know, that's a lot better. See how it's doing in different spots. Um, but there are a lot of great classes out there. You know, there's a, uh, of course, the Master Garden Program is incredible. There's a, you know, different native plant ch society chapters. And so I would just kind of immerse yourself. And um, if in doubt, the toughest are gonna be probably the, the true natives. And I would ask or read up on them. Or these days, boy, you just pull it up on Google and you know find all kinds of stuff. And then um, and then try to one way or the other find some reliable plantsmen or, or ladies that you know can give you some good knowledge. And I <clears throat> maybe I shouldn't, but I'll put in a little plug. Out we talked about the compost and uh, the uh, mulch that they make out there, and they, they now have sell sell. You have a, a nursery. We do have a small nursery, and our primary use for it, we actually test all of what we make to make sure it's all working right. And um, and then we have some, you know, unusual stuff out there in native. But when I've been out there, I think most of the people that have helped me have been master gardeners. We are very partial to master gardeners and master naturalists. So that, we that, know they know their stuff. I'm yeah. pretty sure the guy I talked to yesterday in Lowe's was not. Because <laughs> he pronounced it Burma grass instead of Bermuda, so I was uh, <laughs> Burma, Burma grass. Anyway, uh, the other thing I wanted to say was that I transplanted some Turks cap from my mother's house in Galveston County years ago, and it's rewarding to see that when that really comes into bloom, and I have some so-called hunting uh, hummingbird plants that are, they've actually stayed away from the feeder and spent more time on my garden. So that's pretty neat too. And just remember, you can do any style you want. Don't let ever, you know, sometimes people will have a different impression, but in any style is possible with, with native plants. Thanks again. Another applause for you.